This video is brought to you by Wondershare Filmora. So a lot of y'all are starting channels. A lot of you have been asking me what software I use, what I use to edit, all of the things. And I use a few different softwares, but I recently tried this software, Wondershare Filmora, to edit this video. And it's actually like the perfect combination of editing software that's sophisticated, but also easy to use. And it's free to download. They have a lot of really cool features like keyframing, motion tracking. I especially liked all of the effects that you could do because I know in a lot of other softwares you have to do 10 million steps to add an effect, whereas on Filmora you just click the effect and it's there and they have so many. So if you're starting a channel and you don't want to spend all this money on all this extra software because you're paying for all this equipment and you have iMovie but you're trying to get something more sophisticated, trying to, you know, give the girls a little bit more fun in editing, then I would highly recommend you do Filmora. So you can click the link in my description to download it for free or just check out their website and get a free download and just get started editing. You were bombed and have physical scars. We too have been bombed and you saw some of the scars in our neighborhood. We are constantly hit by the bombs of racism, which are just as devastating. At the home of Yuri Kochiyama, Malcolm X said these words, addressing a room of Hiroshima atomic bomb survivors and peace advocates in 1964. Kochiyama and X first met in 1963, after X was following up the aftermath of the arrest of over 600 protesters protesting the Downstate Medical Center in Brooklyn. In a 2006 interview with Democracy Now!, Kochiyama described the scene, saying, I felt so bad that I wasn't black, that this should be just a black thing. But the more I see them, also happily shaking his hands and Malcolm so happy, I said, gosh darn it, I'm going to try to meet him somehow. This meeting between Yuri Kochiyama and Malcolm X would further radicalize Kochiyama's interest in black nationalism. Yuri Kochiyama was born in San Pedro, California to parents who were Japanese immigrants. She was first radicalized when the US government started targeting Japanese communities following the 1941 bombing of Pearl Harbor. Kochiyama's father was arrested as a quote, threat to national security following the bombing because of loose associations with Japan. He was quite sick when he was sent away for six weeks and then died the day after his release. Soon after, President Roosevelt ordered the internment of thousands of Japanese Americans, displacing them from their homes and imprisoning them in camps. Kochiyama and her family were forced into Camp Jerome in Arkansas, where they would be interned for three years along with 120,000 other Japanese people. As X and Kochiyama grew closer as allies, she began attending his organization of Afro Unity and enrolled in X's Liberation School. FBI files lovingly referred to her as, quote, ringleader of black nationalist and a, quote, red Chinese agent, even though she was Japanese. And we'll talk a little bit about seeing all Asian people as one interchangeable ethnicity. Like, we'll, we'll, we'll talk about that. On February 21st, 1965, just two years after Kochiyama and X met, Malcolm X was assassinated as he prepared to address a weekly meeting of his organization of Afro-American unity. As a crowd dispersed, fleeing from the gunshots, Kochiyama ran towards Malcolm X. I just went straight to Malcolm and I put his head on my lap. He just lay there. He had difficulty breathing and he didn't utter a word. And in the now famous picture, Kochiyama can be seen cradling Malcolm X's head as he lay dying. We're gonna do a call and response song this time, right? Okay, so I'm gonna show you how it goes first and then you'll repeat after me. Ready? I'm wearing something other than black. I'm wearing something other than black. And y'all will say, with them out something other than black. I'm wearing something other than black. With them out something other than black. I'm wearing something other than black. Something. Other than black, I'm wearing something other than black. <laughs> the amount of time I say things on this channel. Damn. Hello and welcome slash welcome back to my channel. 
My name is Khadija, your favorite internet play auntie. Hello to all my returning nieces, nephews, and nibblings, and my fellow aunties, uncles, and piblings. If you're new, feel free to take a look around, suss out the vibe. I sit on my floor, talk about whatever I want, and sometimes I do video essays and talk to my friends and all the things. Today, I want to do a video that's going to be a part of a series that I want to start doing, tackling stereotypes of different marginalized communities. This is gonna be the first trial run of this, and if it flops, if it's not the wave, if people are like, girl, this isn't your fight, walk away, fair enough. But as y'all know, I wanna just, in my little corner of the internet, I wanna carve out a place where people can feel comfortable to learn and grow and make mistakes and teach each other and teach ourselves and all the things. So with everything that's been happening lately, all of these conversations about stopping Asian hate, I have had to do some reflecting and some learning. And I just wanted to use this platform to bring the stuff that I'm learning to y'all. So doing a quick disclaimer for this video, I just wanna make it clear that I'm not trying to take up space or speak over anyone or anything like that at all. Like I said, this is stuff that I was interested in learning about to just educate myself better because I think if you're gonna be an ally to different marginalized groups, you just, you, you gotta learn what, what it is you're fighting. You know what I'm saying? That's where I'm coming at with this. That is my intention, but I know, and the reason that I'm saying this is because you could have the best intentions in the world, but impact is a real thing. So I will link other YouTubers that y'all should check out, but yeah, let's just, spread the love and, and spread the knowledge and, and find a safe place to learn. So we'll see. So this video is going to be focused on East Asian stereotypes for women and femmes. That's gonna be the specific, not only, but more specific. There's still a video that I have to do on black male stereotypes. So there's definitely gonna be one on East Asian male stereotypes. Again, only if people want to see more of it. If y'all are like, girl, shut the hell up, like then that won't happen, you know what I'm saying? So this video, how we're gonna do it is we're going to talk about yellow peril. We're gonna talk about Edward Said's conceptualization of the Oriental. And then we're also going to go into three specific stereotypes, the China doll, the dragon lady, and then I'm gonna talk about the model minority because it's not exclusive to East Asian femmes or East Asian people in general. I think it's it's a stereotype that's kind of used for all Asian folks, but I think it's important to talk about that stereotype because it does kind of relate and, and give a little bit of context to why there's such a interracial discrepancies, interracial tension, let's say, between other groups, other marginalized groups, other people of color. So yeah. Can y'all tell I'm nervous about this? I'm, I'm gonna be transparent. I'm nervous because I don't, I, I really don't wanna f it up. And I really don't want to, uh, I really don't want it to seem like I'm trying to like come on here and, and say that I know everything about what it is to be East Asian and what East Asian women and femmes go through in their stereotypes. I'm, I, I, you, can you tell that I'm just like really like trying to make sure that that's like not how it's coming across? With all that being said, let's get to the video. <laughs> Black and white, life and death, good and evil, two sides of a chess game, two forces in the universe, one magnificent, the other sinister. It is said that the devil plays for men's souls. So does Dr. Fu Manchu, Satan himself, evil incarnate. So what is yellow peril? Yellow peril, also known as yellow terror, is a racist color metaphor that represents East Asian people as an existential danger to the Western world. In order to understand how yellow peril became a thing, we need only look back to the 19th century. So on one hand, you have the story that America brought over Chinese and Indian laborers known as coolie workers to replace emancipated black folks during the reconstruction era. But then on the other hand, the story goes that the opium wars of the mid 19th century between England and China left China in a lot of debt. So pairing that debt with the floods and droughts that were happening in China, there was this exodus of peasants from their farms. 
many emigrated out to find work in the US or elsewhere. Whether they were brought over or immigrated, these workers were hired cheap, which meant they didn't receive as much money as their white counterparts. And we know how America feels about immigration when the people coming over aren't So of course you saw this backlash of white laborers seeing these Chinese immigrants as threats. They're gonna steal our jobs! But it wasn't just about them feeling threatened because my favorite thing to do when I'm learning about these things is to follow the money. And what was happening in America and Canada's West Coast at that time was the gold rush. Gold! So after a major crop failure in China in 1882, over 20,000 Chinese immigrants came through San Francisco's Custom House. To put that into perspective, the previous year saw only 2,716. And as you've probably guessed, violence subsequently broke out and lots of just purebred, good old fashioned American racism. The scramble for mineral wealth, which is extremely ugly. It involves the rape of the countryside, the exploitation of Mexicans, the extermination of local tribes, the mistreatment of Asians who come in as laborers and are also very badly treated in the mines. Canada, I got something for that ass in a moment. Don't act brand new. California started imposing these taxes on foreign miners that targeted Chinese miners mostly. And in 1854, the Supreme Court case People v. Hall ruled that Chinese people couldn't testify in court. At that time, Chinese people couldn't, black folks couldn't, indigenous people couldn't, you just, you just couldn't testify in court. So this made it impossible for anyone to actually seek justice for the hate crimes and general discrimination that they were being faced with. So two things happened as a result of all of this madness, all of this racism. Why am I calling it madness? It's racism and discrimination. Let's call it what it is. And call me by your name, and call me by your name, and call me in a boat. I'm sorry, I really haven't I've been really about that song. Okay, we're back. The first thing that happened is that more Chinese people headed north to Canada, and there they were also met with racism. I mean, in 1855, a commissioner described Vancouver's Chinatown as a, quote, ulcer, and suggested that if left untreated, it would, quote, cause disease in the places around it and ultimately the whole body. Canada, why do y'all do this? Like, why do y'all act like you're not as bad as America? I just, I just need to understand. Daddy Trudeau, you want, you, you can't explain? Hmm, I'm listening. My edges are slipped back, I'm listening. The second result of this racist and unfounded fear of yellow peril in America was the creation of the 1882 Chinese Exclusion Act, which was signed by President Chester A. Arthur. Y'all, who is this man? I've heard of a lot of US presidents, but who the f is this? I literally, I do not know her. Who is this? Here, I don't want to I'm sorry, I'm back. On May 6, 1882, Chester A. Arthur disrespected Chinese folks and any tourists around the world by signing the Chinese Exclusion Act. This act was meant to suspend Chinese immigration for 10 years and declared that any Chinese people already in America were ineligible for naturalization. Then you had the Gary Act of 1892, which reinforced the Chinese Exclusion Act for another 10 years. And then in 1902, America was like, F it, let's just make Chinese immigration illegal. Racist Immigration Act, Racist Immigration Act, Racist Immigration Act. Under the new law, immigration remained opened to people with a college degree or with special skills, but entry was denied to Mexicans and disproportionately to Eastern and Southern Europeans and Japanese people. At the same time though, that legislation allowed for more people to immigrate from Northern European nations like Britain, Ireland, and Scandinavian countries. They basically just wanted skilled people, people with college degrees and white people. So all of these laws and policies were from a lot of different factors, but at the center of this was this yellow peril fear. Americans and Canadians were so worried about the idea of hardworking immigrants coming in and taking their land, their jobs, their gold, their space, all of it. American Canada were lands that immigrants could come to to find success if they worked hard enough. But these people weren't white, so what the f were they doing here? 
So this idea of yellow peril wasn't always so prevalent, especially when you talk about Europeans first interacting with the East. I got a copyright strike, -na 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 -na, and now I can't get no money, -na 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 -na, so I had to take the audio out, and I can't remember what the melody is. Why is this clip so long, Khadija? <laughs> Back in the 70s, Edward Said, an academic and founder of the field of post-colonial studies, published a book called Orientalism, detailing how Europe constructed a stereotypical image of the Orient. He argued that Orientalism became a discourse which could be managed and even produced by Europeans. Said goes on to talk about Western hegemony. That's just basically Western dominance. I honestly don't know if I'm saying that right. I always like would read that and never said it out loud. You know those words that you read but you never say out loud? Hegemony is one of those. Anyway, this Western dominance led to a sort of voyeuristic studying of the Orient in academic spaces and on display in museums. And y'all know I talked about this book in my Meghan Markle and Harry video, but this book talked about how, or described how the Orient was basically being constructed in the quote, colonial office. Now, if I'm doing a video and I'm more so supposed to be talking about three specific stereotypes, why am I talking about yellow peril and the Western image of the East? Why, like why? <laughs> Because context, duh. And honestly, in order for me to learn about this, I felt like it was really important for me to know how the West first interacted with the East and the subsequent backlash that followed many, many years later. Because those two, I think, are linked when it comes to talking about stereotypes. They didn't just pop out of nowhere. These stereotypes are rooted in anti-Asian racism, the yellow peril fear, and the existence of this ideal of the exoticized other, exoticized oriental other. As Joey Lee puts it in her paper, East Asian China Doll or Dragon Lady? Quote, The Orient was almost a European invention, becoming a distant land of romance, danger, criminal experiences, and essentially a place in which white people were privileged with entering and exiting to escape their burdens. Which brings us to our first stereotype. You pick any girl for you and your friend. Any girl? Any girl. I'll take that one right there. She got to come. Oh yes, she's very nice. She is nice, but I hurt my back and my neck and I need a little bit more massage, you know? So I'm gonna take her in the pink too. Oh yes. And let me get her, baby. And then I'm gonna have her. Can, can I get her too? And her right there, right there. So there's no way that we can talk about this concept of exoticism without talking about the China doll, also known as the lotus flower or the geisha girl stereotype as it relates to Eastern Asian women and femmes. I just wanna add that these terms are related to each other and their uses and contexts sometimes overlap. I'm gonna mostly just say China doll for this one, but I, I don't wanna be, you know, one of those people that's trying to use China to describe all East Asian women. I don't mean that at all. That's just what the term is. And it's also known as Lotus Flower and Geisha Girl. So as we discussed in Saeed's analysis of Orientalism, the China doll stereotype has its roots in this imaginary westernized figment of not just what the East was, but how women of the East were. Going back to Joey Lee's paper, she talks about how the China doll is seen as this diminutive butterfly that's eager to please and submissive. In films and in operas like Madame a Butterfly, The Toll of the Sea, and Sayonara, she's all of those things, but also willing to sacrifice her life for her lover, her white lover, or die if she can't be with him. But I would love you, Aitha. If that is your desire. This type of careless storytelling implies that the sole point of the China doll is to live for her lover to serve him, to care for him. And if she can't be with him, she has no reason to exist or that she just doesn't want to exist if she can't be with him. And you can say all day long that people don't believe in these things just because they're in movies. <laughs> but I dated a white person. And when I was dating him, this person had the nerve to tell my black ass that he always thought he would be with an Asian girl because his uncle was married to one. He didn't specify what ethnicity she was. He just said Asian. And 
he saw how his uncle's wife took care of him, how she cared for him, and he just wanted to be taken care of. And I was sitting there like, something in the milk ain't clean. Like I wasn't even like, well, I'm black. How dare you say that, whatever. In my mind, I was just like, that's how you view Asian women? What? what? It's like he thought he could tell me that because I wasn't Asian and I'd be fine with it. I don't know, it was weird. It, obviously, I'm not with that person any, like, come on. But still, ooh, weird, we <laughs> okay. So another element of the China doll stereotype is the element of her sexual knowledge. She's got the sex secrets of the East hidden in her bosom and she's waiting for a strong white man to give it to. My twin sister, <laughs> her name Fuk Yu. Fuck you, fuck me, <laughs> see? We give you top secret massage. <laughs> yes, top secret massage, baby. <laughs> so not only is she demure and selflessly serving, she's also sexual and enticing, the kind of woman any man wants. She just doesn't need to talk too much, or at all. Kyoko, where's Nathan? Where's Nathan? Jesus Christ, you really don't speak What the fuck? Oh, no, no, no. Ex Machina. I know she was a robot, but come on, man. Come on. Joey Lee notes that this stereotyping infantilizes but also hypersexualizes Asian women, and that another cause we can point to for this stereotype is the need for yellow peril fears to be quelled. The yellow peril is eased by the apparent objectification of East Asian women, so that the formerly threatening people are transformed into tools supporting white imperial supremacy. Damn. So if the China doll is submissive and selfless while still being a sexual object, the dragon lady is a sexual object that is self-serving and dominating. My fact checker Maddie actually found the origin of this term, so I wanted to include that in here, that the term Dragon Lady came from a comic strip that started in the 1930s called Terry and the Pirates. They introduced this character called the Dragon Lady, and yeah, there are just a bunch of pictures online if y'all wanna check it out, but I was like, ooh, here, yeah, everything starts somewhere. With the Dragon Lady stereotype, she's got power, she's fearless, but she could kill you at any moment. Any sexual prowess that exudes from her is purely to serve her bottom line. And one character that comes to mind with this stereotype that Isabel Panner pointed out in her paper, The Marginalization and Stereotyping of Asians in American Film, is Jiang Zi's portrayal of Hugh Lee from Rush Hour 2. Panner notes that there's this interesting juxtaposition between the way Z's character is portrayed versus the other Asian women in this film. Z's basically fucking people up the whole movie, and the other girls? Y'all yeah, don't know how good this feels. I got in a big fight last night with Triads. Y'all ever heard of Triads? I beat down like 20 of them. Y'all should have seen me, it was on. Mm, yeah. I just wanna point out that there are a few intersections happening here. You know, this is a film with two people of color as the leads, and I grew up watching the Rush Hour movies and love them, but yeah, misogyny is misogyny is misogyny. Uh, hopefully, Chris <laughs> Stucker didn't improv this whole scene but the writers and the director of this film are all white. So you see what happens when even you have a cast of mostly people of color when there aren't white people as the leads, but white people are behind the camera. You still get the stereotypical depictions, okay? Like this woman is talking to him like, your friend is hungry. This is, we're seeing the hypersexualized black male and then the hypersexualized and infantilized East Asian woman. And I'm not even sure if all of those women in the film, in that scene, were East Asian, but you see, like it's. <sighs> boy, 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 boy. Now I should note that a couple of the sources that I read pointed out the strength of the Dragon Lady as a stereotype. They mentioned how it could be positive and empowering to see depictions of badass Asian women in film and television not taking shit, you know? But the downside of all of these stereotypes and tropes that specifically bring out the sexual nature of women of different ethnicities is that at the end of the day, it's all about catering to the white male gaze. That's G-A-Z-E, not <laughs> G-A-Y-S. Gotta say it every time. So the final stereotype that I wanna talk about in this vid is the myth of the model minority. Excuse me, Miss Hoberlin, are you cheating? God, no. Kaizi is my Asian. 
So the model minority trope is one of those that views all Asians as intelligent, hardworking, and ambitious. Boy, I'm sure glad we left the pool party tray. That homework is way more fun. Now you're probably hearing that and thinking that doesn't sound so bad, but we gotta talk about where it came from. In 1965, Lyndon B. Johnson, See, there's a president I recognize. I'm not gonna hype him up too much because Lyndon B had his problems, but he 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 actually signed some pretty interesting legislation. Anyway, anyway. Johnson passed the Immigration and Naturalization Act, allowing Asian immigrants to come to America, but the priority was for highly skilled workers like doctors and engineers. So as a result, you had more Asian folks in these fields immigrating to the States, and certain people started to take notice. One of those people being sociologist William P. Peterson. So Peterson wrote a piece for the New York Times Magazine titled Success Story, Japanese American Style. And that's when you get the first mention of this term, model minority. But see, a model minority isn't just a minority group that's hardworking and intelligent. They're also passive foreigners without dimension. Ones that know how to pull their bootstraps up and keep their heads down and really believe in the American dream. Model minorities weren't the type to Oh, I don't know. Get involved with the civil rights era and cause a ruckus like those annoying blacks. After Peterson's article, this myth began to spread throughout American media and ended up pitting Asian Americans against other marginalized communities, particularly black people. You're so studious, computer. Trey, you could learn a thing or two from his people. They're very wise. Because at the end of the day, you're saying one group of people, look at them, they come in, they know how to be citizens of this country. Yeah, we only want highly skilled people in that group, but they came in and they worked hard and they have success and they don't complain about the color of their skin getting in their way. Why can't you other people do the same thing? Why can't you be more like your sister? Sorry, I don't know why I went into like a New Yorker like <laughs> yelling mom. <laughs> but the other problem with this myth is that Asians that don't fit into that stereotype, that don't fit into that, I'm super smart and hardworking and I've, I have a career in the STEM field and all of these things, it makes them feel like shit probably too because they're like, okay, uh, yeah. People coming up to you being like, you're probably good at math, right? It's like, girl, what? No, just because I am this ethnicity or this skin color does not mean I'm good at whatever. Don't walk up to black people and be like, you can dance, right? I know many black people that cannot, okay? I'm not one of them, but I'm just saying. And going back to the model minority myth pitting other marginalized communities against each other, specifically people of color, and let's talk about black people and Asian folks, it's, we, we just got to. You can look back to the early 90s in LA and see what happened to Latasha Harlins. She was gunned down by a Korean store owner named Sun Ja Du over some orange juice and this incited LA riots. And in the older footage, you can see the way black people are talking about Asian people and Asian people talk about black people, specifically black folks in America, black Americans and Koreans. Like you can just see that tension in the video. In this overwhelmingly black and Hispanic area, Koreans own many of the small businesses. They're insular, they employ their own, they keep to themselves. Blacks say that's the problem. I'm not surprised that the Koreans got targeted because their prices are high, their attitude is wrong, and they just don't seem to have any respect for the black community. I only have one shotgun, that's all I have. What do they have? They have hundreds of crazy people, hundreds of crazy young people with lots of guns. You know how it all started? The first thing when a girl got killed from the Oriental. I'm not saying this is all just cause of the model minority myth, but I'm saying if you were, you know, white supremacist believing and you're like, how can we keep holding the power? I know, we'll get them to think that each other is the problem, not us. They don't look at us, they don't see shit. So there we go, problem solved. We back in power, baby. It's not funny, but you have to laugh because it's absurd. Again, my fact checker pointed out that there is a documentary on Netflix called A Love Song for Latasha. So y'all should check that out too if you want a bit more info and context on that specific story. All of our basic civil rights stem from the struggle of black people in this country. The reason why we can't be fired from our jobs as Asian Americans is because of the Civil Rights Act of 1964. They fought so hard for those basic civil rights 
and we are all the beneficiaries of that. So I just want to say that I know that a lot of us young folks are doing our best to change a lot of these systems of oppression, to educate ourselves on policy, to speak out about injustices of different marginalized communities, to be allies to each other. And that's one of the main reasons, if not the main reason that I, all of those reasons are why I made this because I know that that rift exists between Asian folks and black folks. And just, I know that there's always this, this let's see who is more oppressed mentality for some people. But for me, everything is relative. Uh, what feels like oppression to me is gonna be different to somebody else and vice versa. And so I think that there are times where each of us can have our time in the spotlight and l help lift up somebody else's voice for a period of time. And then the next time it's somebody else, you know? I think, yeah, it is hard to tell every single story at the same time. We know identity is complex, all of that. But I do think that, like I said, that there are moments and times where each group, each person, each parts of someone's identity can have a bit more spotlight and we can share that spotlight and take turns. So I just wanted to be a good ally. I wanted to Golden Girls and I wanted to be a good friend, okay, you know? When everything was happening last year with all of these protests and, and all of these conversations that we were having, you know, I had a couple of my Asian friends reach out to me and provide solidarity and support. And it just meant a lot. So I just want to be that person as well to them because what is the point of doing all of this, fighting all of this, if we're just going to be selfish and just try to create our own supremacy of whatever race or ethnic group that'll look exactly like white supremacy, but it's just a different, different color, different hue of people that are in power. Like, what is the point? What's the point of trying to dismantle it? I do understand as well that for some people, sometimes they want to take a break. They're like, I'm already dealing with so much shit. I can't, I, I don't have the capacity, the bandwidth to stand here and, and talk about all these other things. And that's okay. Like, I can't tell anyone how to live their lives. I'm just saying for me, this is how I do things. This is how I want to do things. This is how I want to move forward. I have the bandwidth and the capacity to do it for myself. And sometimes I will get people that will comment on my videos if I talk about other issues that marginalized communities, other marginalized communities face. They'll be like, oh, black women always have to like stand here and like cape for everyone and like, why? And I'm like, yes, I get you being frustrated. I get it. But again, if we're gonna say that being black or being a black woman with an X <laughs> is for me, uh, is not a monolithic experience, then you can't tell me what I have the space and capacity for. Do you know what I mean? Like, this is my channel. I'm a grown ass woman. I will do what I want on here and I will do my best to listen and learn and try to create a little safe space for people to do the same in my little corner of the internet. And if you are tired of seeing a black person stand in solidarity or uh, help educate other groups of people on things that they might not have known, okay, cool, but I, I'm not tired of it and I'm the one who's doing it. So if it bothers you, I said this on my Instagram story, uh, by the time you see it, it was a couple weeks ago. If somebody is doing something on the internet and it's bothering you, investigate why. Because it has nothing to do with you and people don't exist for you. If somebody's existence, just living their life, doing their thing on the internet is bothering you, investigate why. Because again, let me say it one more time, people don't exist for you. I don't exist for you. I exist for who knows what reason. None of us, I, nobody knows, but sorry, I don't know why this is getting philosophical. <laughs> But either way, I'm saying all of that just to say that I spend a lot of time being very mindful about how I'm gonna come across and, and over explaining myself. And sometimes I don't feel like doing it because I'm just like, whatever, I can do what I want. But other times I feel that it is important because this is my channel. I say the things that I wanna do. I wanna hold myself accountable, but also y'all are watching this content. So I do at least to an extent owe it to you to if something is confusing or if you don't understand why I said something the way I said it or why I'm doing the things I'm doing to explain it or to, to give you more context at least once or twice. But after that, I'm not going to keep doing it. So this is going to be one of the main times that I explain why I am out here caping for my Rainbow Coalition. And maybe I'll say it a few more times in other videos. If you have a problem with it, 
go with God and go in peace. I don't know what to say. But if you're down for the Rainbow Coalition, if you want to come on in and, and, and help and be a good ally, no matter what your color is or whatever, then let's do it, baby. Because we... We can do this, okay? We can change the world. We can change the world. Anyway, I hope y'all enjoyed this video. I hope you learned something. I learned a lot researching this stuff. I wanna give a special, special shout out to my team. Cause now I have some people helping me, which is why it's gonna be a lot easier for me to make these videos on a weekly basis. So Priscilla, she, she's out here holding it down, helping me with the research, just helping me find things because that shaves so much time off of everything. And also to Maddie for helping me fact check all of this stuff and just, oh God, yes, just, oh, it helps so much. And I am so grateful to have these two girls helping me out and, and just being a part of, of whatever this is and what it's turning into because I want to make good content for y'all and I want to also make sure that I'm being responsible and and telling you things that have a basis, have sources, you know, not just talking. Uh, and that was much harder to do when I was doing it by myself. So I'm very happy to have the help. I also want to give a big shout out to CJ the X for doing some narrating for me and Priscilla as well. Just doing some voice acting and all of that. If you haven't checked out CJ the X's videos, I don't know what you're doing with your time. Like you just need to. Um, I don't have other things to say. So I'll just say feed your pets, water your plants, or maybe we should just call them plets. Let's just call them plets from now on. It was a mistake at first, but now we're doing it with intention. Feed your plets, water your plets. <laughs> and remember that you can always change your mind because you can. I'll see y'all in the next one. Bye. Did I say that right? Okay, 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 did I clap? I wanna make sure I say her name right. Chris Tucker being a black Chris Tucker, yes. I'm really trying to be sure I don't flash people. Also, if the titties are bothering you, maybe you should examine why you can't listen to someone talking about something. In this type of body without staring at the titties, okay? Oh, ooh, no, I gotta clap. You gotta clap, girl. <laughs> okay. Plosive and what are the, what is the, uh, okay. Oh, fuck. I'm gonna be 30 in a couple years. I don't care anymore, okay? I've hidden my titties for far too long. This diminu diminutive. Zhang Zi. Zhang Zi. Zhang Zi. I want them to be free! <laughs> I just zoned out. Oh my God, wait. <laughs> Not free the nipple, free the titty! say this word okay I'm very good at hiding my boobs actually <sighs> English is weird English is weird my hair is laid that was a good clap good Egypt good clap okay good lord that was longer than I expected it to be